So, the natural topic is we know how to describe a wave, how does it interact with the material medium, okay. You need a material medium to support the wave, okay. So, you can generate the wave, then it is air and then you have to send it into the body, then it becomes a tissue. So, you need to know how the wave is going to interact, wave the, as we described in equation. How does it going to interact when it is sent into the body? So, we will first introduce couple of uh, terminologies, right, and then we will talk about the interactions, okay. So, we will start with the impedance and then, you know, amplitude, intensity, remember very similar to how we covered uh, X-ray also. First, you know, the flux, photon flux, fluence, right, intensity, that is how we defined and then we use that in our interaction. Similar thing we will do here. First is your acoustic impedance. What do we mean by acoustic impedance? Okay. What is acoustic impedance? Right. It is strictly defined as the ratio of pressure to resultant. So, what is it that we are doing? You have pressure, you are applying pressure difference and the pressure difference is giving rise to particle velocity. Okay. So, impedance means, remember your analogous to uh, your, your mechanical, right, analogous to electrical system that uh, you may be familiar your pressure is the driver here. So, in electricals, it will be voltage that is the driver. The voltage difference drives current. Here, the pressure difference drives that gives rise to velocity. So, uh, what, what do you have the connection between V and I? That is your driver and what is flowing? Oh, V and I is your resistance, right? If it is uh, having frequency, it is, uh, right? you can talk about impedance. So, here you have pressure and the particle has to vibrate, right? Particle has a resultant velocity. So, uh, impedance is very similar. So, your Z is your acoustic impedance in this case is the ratio of P by V, the driver and the velocity, clear? So, in some sense, you could get a feel for why it is defined that way, why the name comes as impedance, but it is an acoustic impedance, okay. So, P by V is your acoustic impedance and this is a very important quantity. Why? Because it is, you can, you can get a feel for it, right. You can already sense that each material may behave differently, right. So, your Z in some sense is related to the inherent material property, okay. But we already talked about uh, material property, we already used some other uh, uh, terms as well, right. So, most commonly it is defined in terms of material property and is referred to as characteristic impedance. Why is it characteristic impedance? Because if I tell you the impedance value, it will relate to a particular material. That is why it is characteristic impedance, it is a material property, okay. We talked about something else as well, oh C, okay. We talked about C as another material property, right. And C was related in terms of your density and compressibility. So, you look at the different properties, all related, but these are all characterizing the medium. So, acoustic impedance is a parameter that is capturing the material property as well. So, you can clearly relate your Z to rho naught C, okay. So, your why is this characteristic impedance? Because it is of a particular material. So, Z is your rho naught C, okay. So, if you do that, it has its own units, right. So, kg per meter cube is your density, c is your velocity, so it is meters per second. So, you are kg per meter square second. However, it is mostly called in rail. What is this rail? This is in honor of a pioneer, Lord Rayleigh, right? Rayleigh theory of sound. So, Lord Rayleigh's contribution is immense to this field and in fact, it is, um, you know, a very old subject in that sense. I think he did the, uh, one of his classic uh, books 
came in 1885 or 1895 or something like that. So it's you know uh, close to more than uh, 140 years or 130 years ago. So it's a well established stuff. So he's done Lord Rayleigh's contribution is immense and therefore this unit is in honor of that called rail. Okay. So this is one way of writing it. Alternatively, because we have the C, we also uh, encountered in our wave equation and we saw that 1 by C square, you wrote it in terms of compressibility and density. right? So I can substitute for that. So I can write as Z is rho naught, C is 1 by square root of. So there is an alternate form also you can write. Okay. But uh, I think this is a very standard way to remember. Z is equal to rho naught C is a characteristic impedance. is a very handy um, relationship. Okay, so that is your impedance. So it can be actually, you know, we have assumed a lossless plane wave equation. So right now we have just uh, talked about a plane wave. There is no loss. So Z is a real number. Okay. Uh, because of this assumption. But reality that may not be the case as we will go, we will see like with uh, other cases, you know, energy is going to be lost in one form or the other. There is going to be some loss, right? We call as attenuation, right? Here also we will have attenuation. And so, in reality, it is not uh, lossless. But for now, the way we have done it is okay. Z is a real number. It can be complex in reality because of the attenuation. Okay, so impedance. Now then the question is, uh, what is the feel for? What is this number? So for water, right? We, we said human body, we are about water bodies. So what is the impedance value of in water? So if I try to send the pressure wave in water, what will be the impedance encountered, right? At some temperature at 35 degrees, what is your Z? Okay. Um, take the log book, you will be able to find the density, right? What all do you need? You need speed of sound, you need density, right? These are there in the log book. If you take that, um, you can get your Z to be 1.5 into 10 power 6 rail. By itself, really this does not convey much apart from its factual information. Where it becomes interesting is, so if Z for water is this much, Right? What are the typical property? What are the typical materials that we are going to encounter in human body? Fat, muscle, right? Water you already have, uh, bone, right? All of these different things. Air. Okay. What are those values? Oh, it turns out you see that apart from these two, fat, water, muscle liver, all of them are about similar, right? Second decimal, first decimal changes, 10 power 6. So, very small difference between the different materials. What is completely different? Air, orders of magnitude difference. Lung is slightly different. But then notice, where do you get air? in the body. Oh, inside the lung, right? So how do you get to the lung from outside? Oh, you have to cross skin, fat, muscle and then you get to the fat, right? Then to the lung. So now the question is, this tells you a important uh, information. We will not uh, cover more than that here because we need to talk about the interactions in more detail. But you recognize here that because of this impedance difference between the various tissue types, right? Ultrasound is inherently useful only for certain clinical applications. In fact, it is useful for vast majority of the clinical applications. But you will notice that some of the applications, for example, lung imaging or seeing inside the lung, it is usually a chest, chest x-ray is what is done to detect lung nodules or whatever. Ultrasound is not that popular. Okay, So, you are going to see the effect of that. That is because of you see this huge impedance 
difference between lung, air and the other material that are there in the body. Okay, so, we will just leave it, recognize that here, but we will come to it in the subsequent slides. Okay, so, then how do you, again, we talked about this number of photons and photon intensity in the previous X-ray based modality. So, here, again, you have amplitude and intensity. What is amplitude? What we have been dealing with, pressure amplitudes. So, pressure is the maximum or, right, the value of the pressure. Okay. So, here this, what does this do? It quantifies the tallness of the waves that were showed. So, in some sense you can relate if you talk about sound, not just ultrasound, sound, right? Because ultrasound is just frequency is different. So, if you take amplitude of sound, you will relate it to the loudness, increase the volume, decrease the volume, right? That has to do with your amplitude. Whereas, uh, so, larger the amplitude, higher the accompanied wave pressure. That is why you increase the too much volume, you know, your, your uh, eardrum, you may get uh, pain because it is trying to push the eardrum back and forth, uh, right? Your frequency is not changing, it is the amplitude, okay? So, amplitude, what is the intensity then? Oh, intensity has to do with some square term per area, right? So, intensity is the amount of acoustic power per unit area. So, you had an amplitude, intensity is your power per unit area. What is your power? Okay, I have my intensity as power by area. What is my power? Oh, power is, uh, you know, I am just trying to, I can just give out your formula, but then I think it is a good exercise to start from the definitions and then build your way so that there is no confusion in the end, okay. So, uh, amplitude, no issues, that is your P that we have been talking about, the pressure amplitude. When we talk about intensity, we are talking about intensity is nothing but your power per area, power is nothing but work per time. How much work can you do per time? Work per time, but what is work? Oh, work is force into displacement or distance, right? Force into distance by area into time. Now, if you conveniently look at it, we have certain terms of interest. Force per area and distance by time. What is force per area? That is your pressure. What is your distance by time? That is your velocity. Ah, So, I can essentially get my intensity is nothing but pressure into velocity. Notice that this velocity is not the speed of sound velocity, not the velocity of the wave. This is of the particle. So, this is another, uh, the, there is a velocity of the particle, there is a velocity of the wave. These two are two different things, do not confuse, okay. So, I is pressure into velocity. This is your intensity, okay. So, from what we have done, right, we already covered impedance. So, using that definition, we can write P, we can change the velocity as P by Z. So, you get P square by Z. So, your intensity is pressure square by uh, Z. The re, right. So, intensity is you have amplitude, square of your amplitude divided by Z, your impedance. So, this is a handy uh, that impedance itself, right, relating particle velocity and pressure itself will be used uh, very conveniently in the description of how this pressure, particle velocity when the wave is moving to describe its interaction. Okay, so this is intensity. So now the question is, okay, I have this wave, I know how to describe this wave, I have used certain terms now to describe the different medium medium 1, different medium 2, they can be different in terms of Z or C. Z is your acoustic impedance or your C speed of sound, density, compressibility, right? So, now the question is, what happens if I encounter a different medium? So, I send the wave and now the wave is going to go from one medium to the another medium. Then how do I describe it? What are the interactions and how do I describe. So, you have going to talk about reflection and transmission of 
ultrasound waves when it is going from one medium to the another medium. Okay. Um, so, when we talk about reflection and transmission, the two things we have to answer. What is the angle and how much is the amount? So, I have a pressure wave or the sound that is going in one medium. I have another medium I am encountering. Which So, I have something that is coming back, something that is going to go further down. How much is going to come is one aspect. How much of it is going to go forward? Right, that is one aspect. Where is it going to come? What angle is it going to come? What angle is it going to go further? That is another aspect. So, there are two details that we need to know. Right? So, the angle of the reflected waves, angle of the transmitted waves or the per and the percentage of the incident power that is reflected back into the same medium and the percentage of power that is going forward. Okay? So, let us take a uh, uh, um, two mediums, medium 1 and medium 2, again our interest is not going to be in the derivation. Okay? We are just going to recognize what it is and maybe you can get a feel for it when we relate it to something that you probably know from your high school with the optics. Okay, Medium 1, medium 2, what have I drawn here? These are the plane waves, plane wave fronts, right? just to determine, describe. These are plane wave, the solid line that you are seeing are capturing the plane wave front. So, for example, this line captures all of them at high pressure, right? So, this is the next high pressure. So, that means distance between the two high pressure, peak to peak is your lambda. So, in between, it is all going down and up. But uh, I am just representing because it is a, a plane wave, I am just putting this line to describe that plane that is propagating, okay? All of the faces are also traveling like that only. So, no problem with that. So, your lambda. So, when it is going like this, right? It is going. I have an interface, right? I have an interface. It is hitting the interface, coming back in the same medium and some of it is going forward. So, I have a wave that is coming, wave that is coming. I have an interface. On the same side, wave is coming back in the forward direction some amount is propagated. That is what this plane waves. Here it is the dotted lines are the reflected waves. The solid line are the uh, transmitted waves in the medium 2. So, you have law of specular reflection which states that theta i is equal to theta r. So, I hit at theta i angle of incidence, angle of reflection. Theta i equal to theta r. Of course, you can talk about from the geometry, you can talk about the D. D is here. From the geometry here, you could talk about D is lambda 1 by sin theta i. That is on the incident side. But D is the boundary. So, D has to be matched on the other side as well. So, D should also be related to lambda 2 and sin theta 2, theta t. Okay. So, if you, of course, your lambda 1 and lambda 2 are not same because these two are two different mediums. Correct? Same frequency, this is C1, this is C2. Therefore, lambdas are to be different. Correct? Because these are two different mediums. C is equal to F lambda. Remember, if F is same, right? C is different, lambda will be different. So, that is what, so lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2. However, at the boundary of this or the interface of the two mediums, you, you cannot, it has to be same, it has to match, right? Otherwise, the interface will give away. So, this has to match and therefore, what you can get is this relationship. This, I am sure, you would have seen. Where would have you seen this? Oh, sin theta i by sin theta t is equal to c1 by c2 is very similar to your Snell's law in optics that you would have studied. Same Snell's law. So, when you are reviewing the Snell's law, when you are reviewing this, you will also understand there is one another important uh, angle. What is it? Critical angle. Okay. Critical angle above which what will happen? There will, everything will be reflected back, back. Total reflection. Same concept holds good here as well. Okay. 
So the so this is so the angles we know theta i equal to theta r and we can relate the incident angle to transmission angle in terms of these parameters. Okay, so so much for angle. What is next? Okay, how much is coming back? Right, magnitudes of reflected and transmitted waves. How do we get that? Again, we'll draw a simplified version. Here I've taken the liberty to just draw one line. This is just perpendicular to the plane wave friends. Right, this is just the line direction that is perpendicular to the plane wave front. So I have just reduced, I have taken all the dashed line and uh, solid lines to make it little clear. But essentially what you have seen here is, I have a theta, theta i, I have a theta r. But now what should be the case? Oh, I look at this. This is the boundary condition. So the whole idea is the medium is going to support the wave propagation. That means at the interface, the interface cannot tear apart, right? Some amount should go back, some amount is going forward, but you cannot, the interface cannot tear apart. That means it has to satisfy a boundary condition. In fact, two boundary conditions. One is with terms of velocity of the particle, the, the medium, right? That particle that is there at the interface. That, that has to be satisfying certain constraints so that it doesn't tear apart. Likewise, the pressure, you have two pressures, on, right? On one side you have one pressure, the other side you have another pressure. So pressure has to balance. If there is no pressure doesn't balance, then also you have a chance of rupture of the interface. So what are the boundary conditions? Your pressure on both sides should match out at the interface. So your PT should be equal to PI plus PR at the interface. And then the component of velocity, right? That's so what is the component? Here is your cos theta t. So Vt cos theta t, that is trying to pull it this side, should also, to, right, Vt cos theta t, Vi cos theta i minus Vi cos theta i minus Vr cos theta r. So here, one is velocity is going this direction, velocity is going in the other direction, reflected. So you get the negative because of the directionality, right. So you have Vr, Vi cos theta i minus Vr cos theta r should match out Vt cos theta t, right? So that has to be balanced. Then the pressures on either side also has to be balanced, okay? So if you do this, then what is the amount that is reflected? Or oh, reflected amount is nothing but whatever is uh, reflected by whatever is incident, right? You could talk about reflection coefficient, a reflection amplitude reflection coefficient because this is just pressure. So these are pressure amplitudes. So amplitude reflection coefficient is the pressure that is reflected to pressure that is incident. Okay. So you can then do subtle rearrangement, use the, right, we know the relationship between pressure, velocity and impedance. Right? One side it is Z1, the other side it is Z2. Correct? So we could use that relationship and write it in this form. I think uh, you there are several ways of writing it. I think the textbook they are writing it as Z2 cos theta i minus Z1 cos theta t divided by Z2 cos theta i plus Z2 cos theta t. Okay? So, just different forms of writing, but essentially you get what is reflection coefficient, the ratio of reflected pressure to incident pressure. Likewise, what is your, uh, uh, we will just observe this and move. Basically, you get the feeling, we talked about some reflectivity, right? You get what it is coming from, where it is coming from, some reflection is there. So, we will kind of see how this can be seen as the reflectivity that we are going, going after. What is going through is your transmission, which is PT by PI. You can you can get this, okay? Of course, so this is with respect to reflection and transmission coefficients of amplitude, okay? So what uh, other possibility is there? What we talked about, you have your lambda, right? We talked about a specular. There is another thing where it is called as specular interface reflection where your lambda is 
much much smaller that is the interface right the interface that we drew you notice the interface that we drew like a, a line there was no um, roughness okay it was very sp smooth line that we had so when the lambda is far far less than the dimensions of the smooth interface we encountered what is specular interface reflection so we had theta i equal to theta r in a so what happens if you are 90 degrees perpendicular incidence right so perpendicular incidence is a simple case where you have an interface which is a smooth interface you pi pr so what we had the equation is in terms of theta cos theta t cos theta i here we have 0 degree so cos cos 0 will be 1 so essentially you will talk about amplitude reflection coefficient in case of perpendicular right reduces to a simpler form r is z2 minus z1 by z2 plus z1 this is your amplitude reflection you could have your intensity reflection coefficient as square of this intensity reflection coefficient is square of this likewise you can uh, do the transmission as well okay so that is not a big deal let's take an example just to get a feel for what it is if you have a fat liver interface so send the sound waves are going they are traveling in fat and now they come encounter a liver so what happens at the fat liver interface well we know the values for fat we know the values for liver right if you look at the table that was uh, shown few slides ago we had z for liver z for fat z for water right your acoustic impedance so now what is the r r amplitude reflection coefficient is going to be z2 minus z1 by z2 plus z1 z2 is your liver z1 is your fat so what is going to be the reflection coefficient right r is z2 minus z1 is only 0.1 okay so before we comment about this little bit further let us see what happens if you have two other materials for example muzzle and air same thing go to the table that we had if it is muzzle air interface when you have perpendicular incidence you have z2 minus z1 when you substitute what do you get you get 0.99 so now the question is okay one is 0.1 the other is 0.99 what is good what is bad what is desirable what is not desirable what, how do we put to context this numbers that we are seeing right so there is a thing there is a good and a bad so what does the reflectivity says i send sound wave in if the wave interacts when it goes to the fat liver right it goes through the fat it hits the liver when it goes that happens r is 0.10 that means only 10 percent of the amplitude the pressure actually reflects back to the medium so in this case for example i am sitting outside i am sending the sound waves in it goes through the fat it encounters liver only 10 percent of it comes back so if i have to capture this what is coming back and then say you came back from this location or there is an object there is an interface at that location then this quantity is going to be very small quantity that i am getting that is the bad side the good side is oh that means there is 90 percent of the amplitude right that is still there to go further so i can come with fat liver interface i will have enough pressure to actually go inside the liver and perhaps come outside the liver and therefore when I am sitting outside, I can see through the liver. I can see through from fat to liver and the, through the liver and maybe liver to the surrounding muscle at the back side of it. So, the good news is little reflection happens and therefore you have enough strength, enough pressure wave to go further down, go deeper. Okay, the downside is I'm getting an echo back, but I'm getting reflected signal back, but the quantity is less. 
okay so in relation to this what do we interpret oh so here what is happening i have muzzle air interface is 99% oh here i get lot of signal back 99% comes back when it enters uh, when when it encounters this uh, interface just to make it vivid let's say i have air muzzle interface right so air is outside muzzle so when i start with the skin and i get muzzle so when i send the sound wave i have a way to generate my sound wave ultrasound i am putting it into the body okay what is going to happen i am going to encounter air muzzle interface right what happens when i encounter air muzzle interface 99% will come back that means i generate this sound wave ultrasound wave try to put it into the body but because air is on one side that is outside the body and uh, muzzle is inside right two different z's i will not be able to send sound inside the body then how will i be able to see what is there inside the body if i cannot send 99% comes out at the at the at the skin it just bounces back right so this is a troublesome thing so what typically they do is when you go for a, if you have been for an ultrasound imaging what they do is they put some acoustic gel coupling gel they call so they put acoustic gel that displaces the air then we have this uh, wave generator that will be uh, placed in that gel so that the sound that is ultrasound that is generated goes through the gel and goes through the tissue therefore you don't have air in the in between if you have air in between you will have air muzzle interface and you won't be able to penetrate inside the body this is the reason when you go towards the lungs right when you go towards the lung it is there inside so muzzle when you go towards the lung one side is inside is air outside is some other soft tissue so you are not able to penetrate the lung so this is a very practical uh, I, i should say constraint that you will encounter um last but not the least is your attenuation right what is attenuation anything when there is a loss this is how we have been talking about right anything when there is a loss here what are the losses possible oh you can send the sound and the sound can go in different directions right or it can get absorbed you are talking about particles that are vibrating so maybe it will take some energy and right it won't be able to there will be some loss absorption okay so a sound beam travels through the tissue its intensity decreases as a function of distance okay so we don't care about what it is sir there is a loss and this we call as attenuation okay so what are the possibilities sources for the loss a reflection and scattering at the interface so i am i am sending the signal some signal we just calculate right r comes back so that means if you are downstream right as you go further in depth the signal is reducing because some amount is reflected back because you have you had some interfaces scattered right so you could not just come at one direction you could go in several direction we'll talk about that in a minute absorption where again you know this acoustic energy is getting converted to heat energy after all you have particles that are mechanically moving so there going to be friction there going to be uh, loss due to absorption okay so typically what we call as attenuation coefficient it quantifies the degree of loss right degree of uh, loss in amplitude with distance Tip, most commonly we call it as db per centimeter decibel loss per centimeter it is represented as decibel loss per centimeter however it is also known right so the alpha is db per centimeter using a a particular frequency okay so in a material for example water it is very less 0.0002 db per centimeter whereas if you go to muzzle it is 1.2 db per 
centimeter. So now the you you see the challenge. Alpha is also using this is reported per megahertz or using one megahertz. Okay, so depending on the distance you are traveling of the tissue type, the signal is going to get lost, reduced. Okay, so now you couple this with the small r that we are going to get from a, a typical soft tissue, fat, muscle, right? Very small r. So you see the quality, the signal level that you are going to pick is going to be very small. Okay. Um, why we said using 1 megahertz? Because depending on what megahertz you are using, right, we call as frequency dependent attenuation. So, if I increase the frequency, right, if I increase the frequency, the attenuation will also, the amount of loss is go also going to increase. So, it is dependent on frequency that is operated. Why would I want, so the question would be, why would I want to then use higher frequency? Because the you know, signal is reduced. I want to probe deeper into the body. So why don't I just use a smaller frequency? Why should I use higher frequency? Remember the relationship between F and C and lambda. Right? For a given medium, if I increase F, what is going to happen? Lambda is going to reduce. Right? So, if I decrease frequency, lambda is going to increase. And we talked about lambda being something related to resolution. The smaller it is, the better the resolution is. Okay? Sub millimeter, we calculated one example as well. So, the idea is, if I want to increase the resolution, I will increase my frequency. But if I increase my frequency, the depth through which the signal will go, right, is going to be reduced or attenuation is going to come into picture. So the signal that you can capture and measure is going to become less, less and less with depth. Okay, so this is an inherent trade-off in ultrasound that you will face. Higher the frequency, lower is what we call as the penetration depth. Okay, better will be your resolution. Okay, so rule of thumb for most soft tissue, we can get about half a dB per centimeter per megahertz. So depending on your problem, acceptable level of image quality, acceptable level of image quality in terms of SNR, in terms of resolution, you pick a frequency of choice. So depending on that's why you see, we will do that in instrumentation as well, but you will see that when you go for a uh, abdomen scan, they will use a different uh, transducer. When you go for, uh, uh, um, you know, some other, say, thyroid or heart echocardiography, they will use some other transducer. So, all this changes or frequency they use is different because depth which they want to interrogate is different. Okay. So, um, absorption and scattering together cause the pressure intensity to decrease. Exp Again, we are modeled this as exponential decay, very similar to what was done in our um, X-ray as well. Okay, So, as you propagate with the distance, there is the exponential decay loss. So, if you have a forward traveling wave, right, P of Z comma T, which is what we want to consider. When you have that, so uh, at, at Z equal to 0, at source, right, at Z equal to 0, you start with an amplitude A naught of a pressure function, right? A sinusoid, cosinusoid that we started. So you can have some amplitude of that. But what happens after it travels certain distance, right? If there is no attenuation, it's straightforward. Your P Z of T will be whatever is the amplitude A Z of T, F of same wave equation that we had, right? So it will have, but if you have attenuation, what is going to happen is this, oh, this has to be A naught. This has to be A naught. Okay. So, at Z you will have the same A naught. Whereas, uh, when you have attenuation with the distance, you are going to have a loss. So, you are going to have A Z will be A naught, whatever you started with, with the distance, you have lost in, in an exponential 
format amplitude attenuation factor in centimeter inverse ok. So, your P z of t is including your attenuation is a naught whatever you started you have some loss e power minus mu a z of this waveform that you started with. Of course, there is another uh, uh, units right they play with which are because your mu a can also be written right you have exponential. So, you can write this in terms of natural logarithm 1 by z ln of a z by a naught. So, here which is called as neighbors, neighbors per neighbors per centimeter. So, clearly you can see a relationship between your uh, mu naught this natural logarithm, but we also talked about attenuation right we talked about this is amplitude attenuation factor, but just before we called something attenuation coefficient ok. So, there should be a relationship between those two. So, let us see since 20 log 10 of a z by a naught is the amplitude gain in dB a straightforward definition a z by a naught 20 log 10 right because it is amplitude if it, it is 10 log then it is power at power loss it is 20 if it is amplitude. So, 20 log 10 of a z by a naught we know right is in dB attenuation we know attenuation coefficient alpha was in dB. So, now I can relate here I see this is in ln natural logarithm. So, I can relate these two as alpha is 20 log 10 base E of mu a. So, this is approximately 8.7 mu a. So, your alpha which is your attenuation coefficient in dB per centimeter is nothing but 8.7 mu a. What is mu a? Is your amplitude attenuation factor you can have neighbors per centimeter. So, if you have that one neighbor is about 8.687 dB. So, you have to be very careful when you read the question right make sure the units are appropriate whether it is in dB or neighbors you have to have this conversion that you have to do ok. So, that is with respect to your attenuation. Uh, last but not least very important is we talked about scattering right we talked about uh, reflection right theta i equal to theta r and smooth interface. So, now what happens if you have a rough interface what do we mean by that roughness is size comparable or less than lambda wavelength. So, everything is an object you have a object whose size is much smaller than your lambda lambda is also length scale right. So, object dimension is less than your lambda. So, what we saw in the smooth interface the specular case was the object size right the interface was much much larger than your lambda. Whereas, what happens if your object size is much much smaller than your lambda that is the case what we call as diffuse reflection or scattering. Two things that you see this is what we saw theta i theta r whereas, here notice theta i no theta r it is going in all that is why it is called scattered notice here it was flat whereas, here you have imperfections you have roughness. So, the object size here is that roughness is you can think about the radius of this roughness right length scale that is comparable or less than your wavelength. If that is the case then you have scattering or diffuse reflection. This is very important what you vividly see is it has plus and minus. What is the advantage? Advantage is, is less dependent. So, if I send a signal, if I send a sound wave I do not need to know the, the orientation of my interface. See if, if it is a smooth interface like this if I send a wave at certain angle I need to know what angle I send so that theta r I can receive the signal that is coming back by placing a receiver at that angle of reflection. So, I need to know this how will I know what is there inside that is the whole idea I want to see inside. So, that is going to be challenging whereas, here what this is saying is no matter what it is angle independent you send it in 
if such an object is there which is less than your lambda then it is going to reflect in all directions so no matter wherever i place i will get some signal so the advantage is it is angle independent but the disadvantage is it is scattering all around so wherever i am picking i am going to pick only a small portion of so i am going to have very limited signal right so it is going to be very low amplitude in multiple directions unless i pick all the direction i am going to essentially have little signal okay so this itself is important scattering is important because it turns out when we talk about organ we talk about the 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 an you know, outer interface that we talked about when we calculated our r that is only specular reflection is okay but predominantly predominantly the object itself right liver or all the tissue itself it turns out that you can think about it as having very small acoustic scatterers are spread in the body so all these tissue are nothing but collection of acoustic scatterers Okay, there are small imperfections interfaces it is not like one homogeneous medium surrounded by one wall it is not like that right because you have cells you have collection of cells right so so the idea is you have small interfaces meaning small acoustic scatterers small in relation to the lambda that we are using about 0.5 or 0.5 mm is the lambda right we saw so you have acoustic scatterers that is distributed in our body okay so our interest is if you have a, a object which is a point object at some location d and i send my plane wave which i know how to write right what is going to happen here oh it is going to go as a plane wave but when it is going to hit the point right it is going to scatter all around what does that mean that means we can now treat this point is going to reflect everything and the waves are scatter everything right and the waves that are going to come back are more close to spherical so i send a plane wave this point object has converted that plane wave into a, a spherical wave how much of it is coming back oh that depends on the reflection coefficient of that object right impedance mismatch between that point that that point object's material characteristic compared to the the surrounding right so we can actually write our plane wave equation which we know we can actually write our wave equation in spherical coordinates which also we know from before but how do we relate those two by relate those two in terms of the reflection coefficient r right so you can write your source wave which is your plane wave we know from before you have a not e power minus mu a so this is the one that is coming and hitting okay so when an object is much much less than your wavelength is located at 0 comma 0 comma d which has with a reflection coefficient right it has impedance mismatch and that impedance mismatch gives rise to a, a reflection coefficient so with r right so spherical wave is generated you can write the equation for the spherical wave as pr of t is this is your r reflection coefficient exponential of mu a r so after it comes it is decaying with r what is that this is your source right so r f t minus c so it is gone in one direction is coming in other direction right going towards d so your r small r is nothing but distance from this point 0 comma 0 comma d this acts as your source now so now this is what you are you are going to capture so i am going to send in a wave that is going to be converted by point into a scattered signal the scattered signal can go in any direction and if you are going to pick up the reflected signal at any location this is the signal that you are going to go after okay so uh, this is a very important uh, concept okay 
most of the time you would have seen in ultrasound unlike your chest x ray in ultrasound the you know you have a, a probe we we'll talk about it when we go to the instrumentation but in general what you have observed right you have a probe which generates the signal and it also acts as a receiver so you keep it you are only doing on the same side you are not doing through transmission you wouldn't have seen one probe sitting here and the other probe or some instrumentation on the back usually right you if you have gone for an ultrasound scan you would have noticed that so it is on the same side so the whole idea here is i send a sound signal that gets bounced back because of the material property how the material is distributed how the acoustic property how, how acoustic scatterers are distributed in the body based on that i get my echoes back i send the acoustic pulse i get echoes of that pulse so typically we operate in what is called as pulse echo ultrasound imaging so this reflected signal or the scattered signal right it can be reflected or scattered whatever you are going to get the echo okay so this is how you can write that so we'll stop here this is good with respect to our structural part reflectivity we can get the distribution of reflectivity which encapsulates the density compressibility which can be talked in terms of either speed of sound or your acoustic impedance z right particle uh, so all of this is captured in the r okay so now we will have to talk about the doppler principle which can be used for our blood velocity which will be left to the next lecture